please welcome to the Apple Store Covent Garden in London tonight's host, Boyd Hilton. Thank you very much for coming to this very exciting uh, event at the Apple Store, uh, Meet the Filmmakers, The Finches Demons. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, we're about to see the third and final season of this uh, spectacular show that's become a global phenomenon. And today we're going to meet the cast and creator of the show. I'm going to ask them some uh, fascinating questions, hopefully, and then you get to ask them some questions as well afterwards. Before all of that, let's have a look at the trailer for the new season of Da Vinci's Demons. Leonardo Da Vinci. <laughs> Everything you told me was a lie. And you needed to see what you are capable of. The enemy is near. They have my weapons and my designs. How can I find myself? We need you, so let the next choice be the one that defines you. Soon the day will come, the world without hopes or kings. Call for a crusade. Let me point back. Make some poor choices, not when it matters most. The final series of Da Vinci's Demons on Fox. Pretty exciting. Even more exciting, let's welcome to the stage the creator and cast of Da Vinci's Demons, David S. Goya, Eros Flahos, Blake Ritson, and Tom Riley. Welcome. There you go. Uh, David, let me start with you. you. This is your creation, this is your baby. Um, it's, this feels like one of the sh these shows where the audience um, love for it is huge. I told, when I told people I was hosting this event, they were like, oh my God, I love that show. Uh, when's it coming back, blah, blah, blah. When you first mooted it as an idea to stars in the States and Fox here, did you think, oh, this is gonna be, this is really gonna get to people, this is gonna be something that's gonna touch people and they're gonna be really excited about? Or do you think this is my thing? I'm fascinated by this guy, Leonardo da Vinci. I'm gonna do it because I wanna do it. Um, the latter. Okay. I mean, it was, uh, I, I, I was into the idea but it was a crazy idea, and it was not a straight biopic. So it was a sort of historical fantasy, a kind of graphic novel reimagining of Da Vinci. It was something that you do in comic books a lot or in fiction. But when we were first sort of pitching it, it was hard for people to envision what we were doing because I wanted the world not to look exactly like Florence looked at the time. Yeah. Um, and so we had to do kind of sizzle reel in order to show people. But I, I had no idea how, whether or not it would catch on. We hoped it would. And it's nice to have gotten three series seasons in and um, made some amazing friends. You, you're not, you don't always become friends with the people you work with. But in this case, we did. And in terms of, like the, you, Tom, in terms of casting Tom, was it hard to find someone who... And this is, it's, you kind of turned him famously, you know, with people often compare him to Indiana Jones. He's kind of an action hero, but he's a genius and he's very sexy and handsome, all of these things. Was it fine, hard to find someone that <laughs> amazing? <laughs> Please, I can't wait to hear yeah. this. <laughs> the, the truth is, um, it's no small feat to cast, like, the greatest genius of all time right. and, and whoever's going to play that character. We needed someone who you know, was handsome, but funny, but also a bit of a polymath and could say a lot of words really quickly. <laughs> uh, and, and we did see hundreds of people and, and we, thought, uh, we saw a lot of well-known actors. And honestly, I was despairing about finding the guy because, and we had serious discussions about, about pushing the shoot uh, because I didn't feel like we could find him. And Tom walked through the door pretty late in the game. Um, and I just remember, I, I was sitting next to one of my other producers, and I, I just wrote, that's the guy, like with a, like an arrow, while you were in the room. Like yeah. you didn't even, so, I don't know. You can take it from there. Was it hard, <laughs> being a genius, being cast? The writing was so strong, David, that oh, it, was just, it all did the work for me. But you weren't, when you came in, you weren't completely 
taking it seriously or you don't think it would happen or no i i mean i was asked to come in very late in the day like david says i think i'd missed the earlier rounds because i was working on something else that wasn't in london and uh, i got a call the day before asking if i would come in for the fight i think there were 10 people or something on a short list and if i would come in and fill a gap someone else would have to drop out so i didn't it have was like the ringer yeah i didn't have time to really prep hard or which i think helped me it took away some of that kind of desperate attitude that most actors have in, in auditions where you know i just kind of flew by the seat of my pants and it worked out so what was your approach was it was it was, was the thing that attracted you to was it the, the sense of there's a great sense of fun about him as well isn't it, on top of everything yeah else? and particularly in that pilot script you see so i mean it was a long script and it was absolutely ran with characters the world was very vibrant and it was a take on the character that i'd never seen before and it was it just you know like like you say you wanted to have fun with it and i think going into the room and being given the freedom to just play about, which was one of the great things about the audition. It's very rare you get a chance to do it six or seven times over in a, a variety of different ways. And David let us do that, so. And making a show, I think one of the big advantages strikes me is making a show for these particular channels that it's on, Fox and Stars, is that you can get away with all kinds of extraordinary things, can't you? Filth, absolutely. Filth. Filth. Yeah, Absolute I mean, we, we had a <laughs> character, um, simulated pig sodomy, right. <laughs> glued to a pig. I was going to mention that. Yeah, you were way ahead of time in Completely. terms of peak. Yeah. Peak yeah. Yes, we yes. were. <laughs> Especially in this country. You really were. You set the pace. Yeah, that, I mean, that, I guess when you read that, what do you think? You think, okay, right, this is, uh, anything can happen in this show. Well, at that point, we'd been doing the show for two months. We hadn't actually got that script yet. I mean, I don't know if we would have accepted the jobs. <laughs> um, but no, it is. But that was the point. I think that's actually that episode encapsulates best what the show is. It's something that it was trying to say something about that time. It was trying to say something about the sexuality in that time. It was trying to say something about storytelling. And also it was ridiculous. Yeah. And that was kind of the way we approached everything. I, I think it's one of the kind of the really fun things about the show is the unpredictability. Right. I think even from being in the cast, you don't really know where the scripts are going to end up. Uh, so I certainly never imagined I would end up in Peru in a loincloth, <laughs> biting off Incan warriors' earlobes. I mean, yeah. you dreamed. Well, dreams come true. Yeah, uh, you get up to all sorts of horrible stuff. Don't yeah, you, yeah. That must be, is that a deep joy for you? Yeah, I take a kind of relish in it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's your favorite thing in the new, let's begin to talk about the new season. What's your favorite thing about, you go into new, I think you go into new, even more evil things happening to uh, you. Season three, I would say that, uh, I mean, he's in a pretty dark place where he ends season two. He's, yeah. uh, he's sacrificed, he's stuck a dagger in his girlfriend's heart and he's... Uh, Tried to commit suicide unsuccessfully. He's been tortured by a subterranean cult. Uh, he he's con been confessed that he, confessed he strangled, strangled, his, strangled mother. his mother. It's <laughs> very low on melodrama. He's, yeah. he's, he's had a few regrets. Uh, so <laughs> season three, he's, yeah, he's on a pretty perilous course. And I would say it's unpredictable, his okay. actions. And that's kind of, yeah. I don't think even he knows what he's going to do next. No. But he's vulnerable as well. Let's, let's, oh, let's yeah. mention that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's a sweet, sweet soul. <laughs> he's misunderstood. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Eros, what about you? How, 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 where do we see you in season three? What, what's your, the, kind of the, most, the thing you're most excited about story, for your story? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, it kind of felt like the, the conclusion to the, the story that we've been building with Nico for the whole kind of series, really. Um, it was funny when you were talking about reading the pilot script. I remember the first thing I read, the first scene I read of Nico was uh, he goes up in a kite and then he comes down and he's peed his pants. <laughs> um, and that was literally like the first scene I ever read. And I was like, I'm in, I'm in, this is great. Um, <laughs> And then to go on a journey from that place to kind of be able to end up where we did in this season, which is with Nico sort of becoming involved in the politics of Florence and kind of going up behind the scenes and kind of subtly running things. It's just been an amazing journey, and I think it's a great conclusion. I mean, you him. knew who Nico was from the beginning, right? That was always... Seen. Yeah, so he, it, Nico was a young Machiavelli, but we didn't... Uh, he was Machiavelli before he was Machiavelli no. in the same way that Da Vinci was Da Vinci before he was Da Vinci. And so for Eros's character in particular, it's, it's the sort of emerge, the first, he got to grow up in this season. It's the first time you see him being Machiavellian, mm. you know. So it's kind of a Machiavellian or origin story, isn't it, really? For, yeah, we snuck, well a, as, we snuck an origin story in there yeah. for him. Can, by the end of the series, will, we, will, he, will he be fully formed, I guess, as Machiavelli? Can you or say that much? Fully or formed as Machiavelli. Mm. Uh, and not, not fully formed, but you can, you can recognize that he's on the path to become that guy. Yeah, sure. Do you, uh, for all of you, in terms of the, the fan reaction to the show, you know, uh, does it surprise you how intense, I guess, it's been? Tom? Yeah. 
I mean, but it really depends where we are. It's always been, it would surprise us that we've got to go to countries we wouldn't go to where the people are crazy about it. And uh, where, where, Portugal. We're very big Port in Porto. J <laughs> Japan. Port Japan. Which I mean, it's not a, something we would have predicted. Yeah, I don't think any of us thought South we America. to go and shoot in Swansea for seven months of the year that we would get, yeah. you know, our shoes ripped off in Turkey. But <laughs> that literally happened. Their shoes were ripped off. Really? Whose shoes were ripped off? No, not in Turkey. That was in Portugal. But Por Greg, well, okay, Portugal. But, but Greg got, uh, I think, someone swam up to the sea in uh, up in. He was in the sea. Swam up to him in the sea and tried to like hug him so hard they nearly drowned him. Wow. Yeah. Terrifying. It, Greg, who plays Zoraster. Yeah. Right. Do you get like, do you get fan mail and art and all of that? I, kind I, of I oh do. I, to be honest, I think the fan art for Da Vinci's is amazing. Yeah, I've, I've got a small collection of it now. It's, and it's, it's, it's mainly you and me. It's yeah, it's mostly slash fiction or slash <laughs> art. It's, it's mo other. there's tons of paintings and pictures yeah. of, of. But there is also no escape. I've just come back from Malaysia. Yeah. We're big in Malaysia. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, what's your attitude to that kind of slash? Because some, some creators of cool. shows, yeah? Do you think it's cool? I, I mean, I, I, I love that people are invested enough to be, you know, writing their own stories and creating their own artwork. And, and it's, that's how you know you've kind of made a dent or caused some ripples in the time-space continuum, not to reference a TARDIS, but <laughs> there you go. Reference the TARDIS away. Yeah. Feel free. We had a TARDIS drawing in uh, Da Vinci's workshop. On, on one of his pages in the background. You have to hunt for it. Oh, wow, oh, that's great. Yeah. The, let's talk about the visual quotes, because it it, it's, a, it's a kind of visually beautiful show, that from the title sequence onwards to the way you incorporate the design and, and all of that. Was that something that, I mean, I, I don't know about the budget, was that something that you really pushed for right from the start, that it had to have this extraordinary kind of heightened quality? That it's got? It, it was, and it was something that, you know, it was very hard to do when we were doing the first season because I wanted to depict a, a very stylized version of, mm -hmm. of that world. And fortunately, we have a brilliant production designer named uh, Ed Thomas who fully embraced it. And so we did things that were anachronistic. So we decided early on that a lot of the Vatican would be lit by fluorescent lighting, which obviously didn't exist back mm -hmm. then. And I always described our Pope Sixtus, he's kind of like, the version of like the emperor in Star Wars. And so his lair within the Vatican at the time, um, we used to jokingly describe as the Death Star. Uh, and, and we wanted it to, um, you know, not really look the way it looked, mm. for lack of a better word. And then, and then Da Vinci's place, his workshop was a little bit the Bat Cave and Tony Stark's workshop and whatnot. And there's also an underworld brothel, I believe. Come uh, in it, season three, yeah. Yes. Season three, yes. yeah. The pleasure well, all palace. All sorts of shenanigans happen. Eros, do you get to uh, it was hang out in the underworld brothel? Yeah, it definitely. Um, it was a mind-expanding few days on set. That one, I saw some things that I can't unsee. Ever. <laughs> yeah, but the, I mean, the other thing is the scale of the sets right. is enormous. I think it's the largest film studio in Europe, isn't it? Yeah, we made we it's created our own studio because there was a lot of filming going on in London at the time, and we we actually physically couldn't find stages that were big enough. Um, and so we took an old Ford factory and turned it into a studio. It's over 200,000 square feet. And by the end of the third season, I mean, the set just, it took you a long time to walk from one end of the set to the other. And I, like thinking back to season one, we had like one street outside the Ponte Vecchio. By the end, we had a whole city. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's pretty epic. We also had a lot of pigeons that first season, remember? And you would be filming, they would be in the rafters and they'd be incredibly loud and they would ruin takes. And so they brought in hawks to fly around. I remember to this. Kill the I remember pigeons. this day. Yeah. <laughs> oh. No, but then we couldn't shoot for like the first half of the day because there was just the sound of a hawk basically hunting pigeons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like closed down for pigeon hunting. But it must make a big difference to be on the actual physical sets rather than have loads of CGI and all of that. That you're kind of interacting. We, we with still had a lot of loads. Oh, okay. Yeah. Some CGI. Some CGI. Yeah. I mean, it does. It's a lot easier when you can when you almost can look around 360 degrees and see historical Renaissance Italy. Mm -hmm. Um, but like David says, the top of the, the, top of the streets, that's all green screen. So right. everything going up to the sky is green screen, right. Right. as far as the eye can see, but certainly at eye level. But even the papal baths, for instance, that was a set. I mean, I know originally it was hard for you guys to imagine before you saw it, because the papal baths, there was the bath, and then there were no walls. It was all green screen. And so there's a lot of like, or when we did the stuff in Peru, it was like, you know, when you were, guys were at that, 
quarry or whatnot. You were walking on a path that was two feet off the ground, but in CG world would be a thousand feet off the ground. Mm. And I know the people of the, the studio in Wales that you set up and all of that, the, the Welsh, they're very proud of that whole situation, aren't they? You must get what huge reaction from the Welsh. Is there, do you get the feeling of a special love from Wales? I mean, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think we, well, I don't think we got the they, keys to the city made, or anything, but they like you. Oh. They made me a fellow or a, a, like I brought a doctorate from the Royal Welsh College and, th and they made me a, a, I shouldn't say it here, but an honorary VP of the Swansea Swans. Why not say it? <laughs> well, everyone's so Did you ever go to a match? I did. Did you? I went to quite a few matches. Did you? Yes. Who did you see them play? Um, I was at one of the ones early on, which is, it was the game where they got into their premiership for the second year in a row. I want to, was it? I can't remember who they were playing, but yes. I so did. you're a proper Swansea fan, football fan now? I would, I would put on my Swansea Swans, because um, a lot of our crew were from Cardiff. Oh, yeah. And that's, I, you can't say that, yeah. Yeah, but when I was pissed at them, I would wear that sweatshirt oh, cool, on yeah. set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Did the rest of you get, how the rest of you, how devoted do the rest of you feel about the Welsh connection, about filming there and, you know, the kind of reaction you got from the locals? I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of Welsh weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's like kind of a microclimate of misery. There's a lot of rain. Yeah. It's beautiful, but we it's got, We literally, on our first season, got more rain than in recorded history. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating it. Yeah. It rained so much at one point that they have what you call cover sets, where it's like you, you, if it's inclement, which it is in Wales often, you, you, you rush in out of the rain and you, you shoot stuff inside. Yeah. And it rained so much that the water table got waterlogged and our sets flooded from the ground up. Oh, wow. And so uh, we looked at these photos where there was like two feet of standing water in our sets inside. And we had to find cover sets for our cover sets, which doesn't normally happen. That sounds might very, be a first. That sounds stressful. And then yeah. the season two was a little dry and we had a lot of rain machines. So there, there, was, there was no escape. One way or another, it would be wet. So real rain in season one, fake rain in season two. Season three, what's the weather situation? It's snow in season <laughs> okay. three. I don't know. I can't. Did it rain? Yeah. It wasn't as bad. Okay. And yeah, we had also so. built many more sets by that point, so that we had a lot of places where we could scurry to. Yeah. Also, we were just used to it. We just we developed the kind of the sure. steel to take. You bought it. an anorak. Yeah. yeah exactly. Sure. I had an umbrella. Yeah. I, I've seen I've seen um, the first episode seen then, and it's very exciting, fantastic. I want to know from you. Set it, by the way, we should mention it starts, starts Sunday the 25th of October, 9 p.m. on Fox. And it's showing all over Europe, I think, on Fox and stars in the States the night before. Yeah. Very close to transmission, which is good. It means there'll be no illegal downloading or anything like that. Oh. Yeah. What's the most exciting thing for you about this, this final season? As you, the creator, and actually, did you, did you have a finish set up from the start in your mind of how you're going to kind of finish the whole thing? I, I had some loose ideas and uh, certain things that I wanted to do that whether or not it had run three seasons or four seasons or five seasons, we would have done. Um, I, it, was, it was bittersweet. I mean, I think that the fans will feel like there's a proper conclusion right. to this story. Uh, we had ideas of doing, in particular, a fourth season, and maybe one day, if there's enough demand for it, we'll try to do a limited series. Then that would have taken place about 14 years later during the bonfire of the vanities. Oh, wow. But I hope fans feel like there's closure. As a, as, a, as a consumer, I always get disappointed if I'm a fan of something and it just kind of drops off a cliff yeah. at the end. I don't think that happens in this one. What did you think, um, Tom, when you read the kind of conclu the, the, the finale of how, what, how your character would end up? Well, like David says, it's a bittersweet thing, but it's mainly that you're leaving behind friends you've made and you're leaving behind a character that you've enjoyed playing. But actually it does feel like we've been able to end it on our own terms. All the characters' arcs kind of close out. You see people get to points that you've wanted them to get to. Um, and, I, and I do think it ends in a way that you won't feel shortchanged, I think. I mean, it's a shame there aren't more, and it's a shame we can't carry on doing it, but as far as shows being cancelled are concerned, I think we've done this the best way we could have done. Yeah, you know? it wasn't, this, this wasn't like, oh, you're cancelled, goodbye. This was should we continue or not? And there was a long series of discussions. And when we decided to close this chapter, we said, okay, well then, this is how we're going to end it. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, and there's something satisfying going out while you're still firing on all cylinders and it's good stuff. Yeah. It's if there's one scene you can mention that without spoiling anything 
Eros from season three, what would it be? Like the most exciting or oh. enjoyable scene to film? <laughs> He's checking. Wait, I, I don't know. We're conferring. They're conferring, they're checking. Oh, not sure. Oh, no, it was a request <laughs> oh, denied. David's, Hold on. David's just going to check. <laughs> yeah, well, they're spoiling anything. We don't want to spoil it, obviously. This is very exciting. I mean, David well, it's gives stuff it's away left, right, and centre. He'll it? say yes. Okay. It's, it's been in the trailer. Oh, well, in that case. Well, not, not the mm. one. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah? Come on. Yeah, go on. Go on. No? No? <laughs> All right. Okay, well, there's, there's a lot of tank action that goes on, which was very exciting. Let's I, just leave it at that. Just we leave were, it at that. I was always kidding. So, Da Vinci famously designed the tank. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's part of the fun of the show is, like, you, we get to build these versions of the things that he designed and utilize them. And... The tank was always something like, when are we going to use that? When are we going to use that? And it actually pops up in the first episode. It's the first yeah. thing he shows well, to try and get a commission. But, but it, yeah, it's exactly. He, he shows the design of the tank to Lorenzo, played by Elliot. But the tank features prominently in this season, and that was kind of fun. Oh, I'm excited about the tank. Yeah, I'm very excited about the tank. Blake, was there one? What would you pick out? Um, I would say, without being too specific, uh, episode six... Uh, scene 34, <laughs> uh, 27 minutes in. <coughs> uh, the uh, Da Vinci and Riario's relationship takes a new turn, uh -huh. and it gets pretty messy. Oh yeah, that, that it gets. <laughs> it's pretty. It's yeah. That's a fun episode. It's a pretty. Uh, we just act out the fan art for an hour. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> if, if, that was definitely some slash fiction. Took you know. Yeah. Oh, this is very exciting. I'm episode. excited about this. Yeah. Okay. And and I and I will say your final scene is. The whole the final scene series is, is for yeah, you it's, it's, it's is pretty, pretty cool. It's pretty good. Yeah. I didn't I didn't want to kind of talk too much about it because I feel like it'll be a nice no, surprise. But it's, but it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Tom, apart from this this extraordinary sounding scene with the two of you, which I oh, it's not a scene. It's, it's an not episode. a scene. Oh, it's, it's a, a marathon, scene. if anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I would say to be honest, the first two episodes, which are like a kind of two hour war movie, and it was yes. exhausting, but. Um, a lot of mayhem. Yeah, a lot of action. A lot of mayhem. Yeah, a lot of but action. it goes like a rocket. And yeah. the, I showed my dad <laughs> the first episode, not like a very early cut of it, and he, uh, he didn't breathe for the last <laughs> 20 minutes. Yeah, He's fine. But um, it's, fine I just, now, it's, yeah. it's, it, it's tense, and it was exciting to shoot. We hadn't really done anything on that scale before, so that was cool. Yeah, it's tremendously exciting and ambitious. I mean, did you, was that one of the things you wanted to do? You wanted to kind of open with this epic kind of... Well, yeah. I mean, this season on a, on a kind of thematic level we, and we talked about it it's sort of even there in the first episode is the, the idea is it's, it's one thing to come up with these crazy designs you know as an intellectual exercise and it's another thing to actually build them and see them used and so Leonardo wrestles with that a bit in the first season and then you know in this season it's sort of put to use on a very grand scale so instead of dozens of people dying hundreds or thousands of people are dying and so there's a lot of parallels to things like Oppenheimer and the other scientists when they built the atomic bomb and, and you know, this sort of collision between pure design and then once that design is co-opted by others, um, which is not to say everything is so highfalutin in the show. Yeah. But it's interesting, I was going to say, how you do kind of, you, you have both, it works on both levels, you have on one, on one level it's an incredibly riotous romp where you're all, you know, there's lots of, Ad action, but on another level, you are saying stuff about you're saying stuff, aren't you, about I hope violence and you know the advance of civilization, I guess. And the yeah, and also, I mean, in our own way, we don't want to preach, but it's no. since a lot the third season's mostly wrapped around the invasion, the siege of Otranto, which was this real event where the Ottoman Empire invaded Italy. You know, on one hand, from the sort of from the church's point of view, you know they're the heathens, you know, this is the, the barbarian horde that's coming to destroy mm. Christendom. But, but at the time, the Ottoman Empire was probably, you know, the most advanced civilization in the world. And so there's a really interesting scene in character, this guy named Gedek, who was the leader of the force that laid siege to Toronto. And he's got this interesting conversation in the middle of the season in which he says, okay, yes, that's happening, and we're, you know, basically forcing people to convert, but, but you guys did the same thing to us during the Crusades. And so this is a quid pro quo. So one of the things that we've tried in our own way to talk about is that Da Vinci's a guy who would pull from 
any religion or you know any country or any sort of civilization and and they all have their highs and their lows and there's no sort of one way that's perfect i think yeah i really i think the the moral complexity of season three is really fun like i think it's always been quite a morally ambiguous universe but this yeah. is now a show where even the good guys do really bad things to survive and it's it's really blurry it's really murky who are the good guys who are the bad guys yeah absolutely yeah anything to add tom <laughs> I'm the good guy. Uh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. But you do, but you, yeah, you end up doing stuff that's... Well, that's true. It's very true. In fact, to be honest, the, the truth is for the last two seasons, a lot of Leonardo's actions have been uh, not ideal. And no. he's never had to pay any consequences for them. But in this final season, he, him, he, Riario, Lucretia, they've kind of left behind a trail of bodies in their wake and that all comes back to haunt them. They're going to have to face up to their consequences. And it's a chance to take him as the Leonardo that we found once we sort of dug into his early letters and how he behaved as a youth to a Leonardo that's more true to the image that people have in their minds of him today. So he's sort of driving slowly but steadily towards humility. There's also a, without revealing it, there's a, um, I think a fan favorite character from the first season that returns in the third season um, that uh -huh. I think will be very fun oh, for okay. the audience. Which episode is that? I am not uh, going to okay. say. It, but <laughs> this character is in more than one episode in the third season. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, if you're not already excited enough, now you get to ask your questions. So if you have a question, put your hand up. I mean, we'll have some mics so we can all hear you. Uh, there's a lady there, yeah. Which way for a mic? Oh, there, we, there you go. Okay, hi. Um, this is for the whole board. Um, I know that a lot of actors keep things to themselves about their characters and like maybe discover or invent like specific things. And I was just wondering like what is one thing each of you have about your characters that nobody else knows? Well, Riario was actually a traveling minstrel. Uh, he used to play the mandolin in the countryside. He was very talented. He had a, a different life that never was, but uh, never made it into the show. So that's a shame. It's a real shame. You, you play the ukulele, don't you? I do, yeah. Yeah, in real Riario life, doesn't. but it Riario would have been strange um, if Riario broke out in song on the ukulele. <laughs> That's a really good question, because it, you do try and sort of, especially in the first series or something, you prep a bunch of backstory and you try and fill in the gaps. But the weird thing about doing a series is that as it progresses, the writers will write more things that perhaps go against what you thought were your passwords, and you have to recalibrate actually, that I, in your I mind. can think of a genuine one, which they built on, actually. I remember talking about Riario's obsession with the Orient, because there was you know, the widow, Widow's Tear, this torture device, is from the Orient, and then he plays Go. Uh, and then suddenly, the costumes started looking like 15th century samurai kind of silhouette. So they, they kind of, sometimes you talk about people, it's quite a collaborative process, and they kind of build on things. I meant, oh, I've got I, one. I have the Widow's Tear, which is this crazy device that's in, I think, the second episode of the first season is this horrible torture device that Riario uses on, um, on Nico. He still has the scar. Yes. But um, uh, I have it, the actual prop, uh, because when they, we were shutting down everything, um, uh, Ed had it mailed to me. I and almost, I was, I I almost asked one. for that. It's I almost in, asked for that. I know. It's that. in my office. I, was, I meant to take a picture of it. I just got it last week and to show it to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just Sorry. say the, the prop that I got was from the brothel scene, and it is really extreme. <laughs> I asked for it as a joke, and then it turned up. <laughs> At my parents' house, <laughs> and that was that was one dinner. That was one hell of a, an evening. That one. Um, one thing that I have that Greg and I, who plays Zoe, because we were, I was always very adamant that Da Vinci was bisexual and had no interest in being defined one way or the other. And Greg and I decided that we were in love. And there's never anything in the scripts really, but we kind of seed it throughout. There are moments where we almost have a little cheeky kiss. That wasn't I in the script. But I think if you it was think mostly about off it, camera, to be fair. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I think if you think about it in that context, I think th that warmth and that relationship does. I think it is there in the third season. Yeah. Well, we really we no. push it in the yeah. third season. Yeah. You should let them push it as far as they wanted to go. I think. Yeah. But you can't have endless amounts of man on man action. That's what I'm saying. Not anyway, endless. let's move on to another question from the audience. Yes, lady at the front. Get the mic. There you go. I actually have two questions, if that's all right. Sure. Um, first one is for Blake and David. Um, in the histories, Riario is married to Katarina Sforza. Is there a chance that we'll see her this season? Ah, uh, you know, we 
we really wanted to do that. And um, if, if we were to do the fourth season or if one day we do like a limited series, she was going to feature very heavily because that was a really interesting relationship. And it's hard because you, you, you put on the board like all of these things you want to get to. And it, it's sadly, she's not something that we got to in the show, but she was, she was on the drawing board for a while. Yes. <laughs> uh, and this one's for all of you. Um, da Vinci is one of the world's most famous autodidacts. Um, what is something that, you, that it, the show has taught you or that you've learned from this experience? That I didn't know previously, or that we didn't know. I didn't know he dug up dead bodies, cut them in half illegally, and then filled them full of candle wax so he could sketch them. I didn't know that the sigh of a llama uh, has such a melancholy tone. Such a really sigh sad. of sublime really sad, disappointment. Aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Aww. And it's they really look so cool, so, like mulletty little sheep. And Gawain, then, the, yeah. Gawain the llama in Peru. Was this question something from the show or something about Da Vinci? Was it I miss here? He, he was in Peru. How could you forget <laughs> oh, Gawain? Yeah. How could I That's forget what that? Da Vinci learned. Yeah. Right. How about you? What did I learn? I didn't know before. What did you learn that you didn't know before? How to sword fight. Uh, how no, to about, how about to sit the on era, about Da Vinci, about your character. So much, pretty much the whole history of Machiavelli. I think one of my favorite ones though, was, was the whole story about um, when Da Vinci and Machiavelli were actually working together in, in real life, which obviously was yeah. in the future, and they had the, the whole plan they were going to reroute the river so it went around Pisa instead of through it in, in order to kind of starve the city. And they would like, because at that time, Florence and Pisa... It was part of, conflict, part of a military yeah. campaign, yeah. It's like, let's, let's just reroute the river and starve yeah, them. Yeah, which I thought was amazing. And, and they, and they um, were going to do it. They were like that, that yeah, nuts. Yeah, they were I, close. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. I, did, I did a little research into 15th century fundamentalism, which is it's just pretty full on. The idea that everyone believed it was the sixth and final age of man and people could actually have communion with nine orders of angels and devils. There was a lot of fun stuff. I still can't tell. We're, remember when we were in Florence... Uh, we, we premiered the show. Uh, those people talked about the um, the restaurant that Botticelli and and Da Vinci. I mean, these are, these were Florentines. One. Yeah, they they said that Da Vinci and Botticelli opened up a restaurant together. Yeah, on the Ponte Vecchio. On the Ponte Vecchio, and that it was only open for a year because they were they, more concerned with the presentation <laughs> than the food. Than the food. It went out of business <laughs> because everything looked really pretty, but it didn't taste particularly good. I don't know if that's true or not, but the historians claimed it was, so. Oh, I'd love that to be true. That's brilliant. Great questions, thank you. And uh, lady at the front here. Hi, um, so I'm Peruvian, so I have to ask, uh -huh. why Peru? <laughs> yeah. You know, part of the fun of this show, trust me, when I pitched that the characters would be going to Peru, uh, Stars and Fox and BBC World, they just thought I was completely mad. In fact, they tried to stop us because they just thought there's no way it'll ever work. There's no way we can pull it off. But once we did, they loved it. And I, I don't know, I just, I, part of the promise of the show for me was always that he would be going to different cultures and, and other parts of the world and the idea that maybe some of these other cultures um, were sort of ahead uh, in terms of uh, you know technology and conventional wisdom and to just challenging like they have different gods and they have different things that are important and you know to people from Europe that might sound crazy but to them you know that's the way they view their lives and so it was in the show it was embedded in the show from the second episode they find a map of South America and um, I just thought it would be crazy to do it and and I I I just think the Inca were so fascinating. And it was, I'm glad we got to do it. It was very hard to find South American or Peruvian extras in Britain. <laughs> I mean, we, we were, there aren't a lot, and, and it was hard to find. Certainly not in Swansea. We had to yeah. bust them all in from London. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Maybe next series you can, you can be supporting actor. Thank you very much. Uh, late towards the back there. Oh, is it a gentleman? Uh, sorry. Apologies. Thank you. Now, when they talk about, say, who is, what Leonardo da Vinci did, there were so many things. I mean, it's like the artist is almost the least of it. He was like an inventor, countless others who will forget the da Vinci code. Now, I'm not going to ask you to spoil what's coming up in the forthcoming season, but are there any newer aspects of da Vinci's life which maybe you haven't covered yet, which you are planning to in the forthcoming seasons? 
or not really? <laughs> uh, I, it's, it, I mean, it's a really good question. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to remember if there's a new, um, well, yes, actually, <laughs> one of the other new characters. Mm, yes. Uh, we can't say who. Right? Yeah, but no, we can't say who. And then we get into also some, there are, you know, if, if people have been paying attention, there's some interesting questions about, you know, his lineage and all kind of wrapped up in his mother and what was going on in there. And so I think we also raised some interesting questions about, about that as well. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything, any sort of new aspects to him as a polymath, though. I think we kind of, we covered so many of those in a race through the first season, couple of seasons. He did his grave robbing, engineering, artistry, designing. Tick that tick box. That box. I mean, yeah. we, we find new inventions that, uh, that he, he designed that we hadn't covered previously. Um, and we I did think, astronomy. But, we've done astronomy. Yeah, but I, but I think he, he does discover more about his personal history in this season. Because part of the quest of the show is him finding his mother. And you get to, you know talk to your mother in, in a sense. Interesting. Thank you. Another great question. And who else have we got? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so First off, uh, for David, um, what would be your advice to an aspiring filmmaker who's trying to get a series off the ground? And then for the actors, what is it that draws you in and makes you say you want to be a part of something like this? So uh, an aspiring filmmaker, um, send all your scripts to Tom. Uh, <laughs> not me. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you his email at the end of that, no. Um, gosh, it's, it's, I remember when I was just starting out, um, I was at an event like, not unlike this a long time ago, because I'm very old, and, and I asked that same question, or an iteration of that question. And, and what the filmmaker said at the time was, he said, there, you know, there's no one path to getting a film or a TV show made. It's, it's, everyone has to take a different path and figure out how to get there. You have to believe in yourself. You have to be prepared to accept a lot of rejection, have a lot of people tell you this doesn't work for all of these reasons. And you have to be sort of dogged enough to just say, screw you, it does work and I'm gonna do it anyway. And, and those, are the, those are the sort of salmon that succeed in swimming upstream and spawning new salmon. You know, not to mix my metaphors, but, but it's true. It's, it's, the other thing I'll say, though, is it's, you know, when I was coming up, digital filmmaking didn't exist. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I, I, there's a filmmaker I'm working with now that we're developing something. He made a movie for 60000 US, which is still a lot of money, but, but, you know, a drop in the bucket compared to what our show costs. I mean, it's like a hundredth of what our show costs. And he made a beautiful movie in his own home with you know, eight actors, and it's really good. And Fox Searchlight picked it up and distributed it. And so at the end of the day, if you can't get somebody big to finance it, then make something yourself. And there was a question to the actors as well about which was what appeals to them about uh, a project, was that it? Yeah. I guess the main question is, for someone who doesn't have the clout of David S. Goyer here, if you're trying to get some talent for a series, a short, a feature, what is it that makes you actually, you know, tell you, oh, let me give this, a, let me give it, actually give this a look and give it a chance? I think the honest truth about actors is that we, it's why people do so many shorts and, and work for free a lot of the time is because it's always about the work. It's really just getting it in people's hands and convincing them to read it when they're being deluged with other stuff from people with David's clout. I mean, it's a chance to sort of, well, if something's interesting and new and in a market where, you know, this, we're saturated with series, it's, um, it can be hard to create I, something I completely original. I think freshness is a, is a definite drawing yeah. point. Anything that is tiptoeing around the tropes uh, and feels like it's exploring a new territory, whether it's a new kind of uh, premise or it's a new character or just complexity as well is, is exciting. Contradiction is exciting. I think it's that. It's, it's whatever we find exciting, really. I mean, that's... That's kind of what it is for me. You know, if I read something and it just kind of think that's great, I, I want to do it, and that's that's all it is. It's just, I guess, it all comes down to kind of the script or the and idea. And the actors who haven't worked for a while because they're desperate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I mean, me. It, but you know, I'm 
in film and television in a couple of instances working with first time filmmakers and it's exciting I mean because the talent is still talent and, and even if they're fresh and new I mean I recognize that and, and I wanted to be a part of, of helping them make their vision Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. We have run out of time, I'm afraid, so let me just thank the panel for their uh, fascinating answers. David, Tom, Blake, and Eros. And thank you all for your great questions. And to remind you, Fox, 25th of October, 9 o'clock, the final season of Da Vinci's Demons. Thank you very much. Thank you.